It is One Soccer Today for this Thursday, January the 18th with Oliver Platt, Garrett Wheeler, and Jordan Wilson. I am, of course, Adam Jenkins with a CPL news drop that has supporters and ourselves alike excited and talking eagerly about the home opener dates for all eight clubs. It was announced today by the CPL office, of course, and we will begin on April the 13th. It is a triple header to get everybody underway. It's Atletico Ottawa and York United. It is Forge and Cavalry, of course, the finals rematch, and Pacific and the Halifax Wanderers with a coastal clash to start the day. We understand that the rest of the schedule will be dropping in the next week or two. We're very excited to get those dates as well. But a matchup that I didn't quite mention yet, gentlemen, is where I want to begin our show. And that is the fact that Valor is not opening their campaign until June the 2nd against Vancouver. If you missed the announcement yesterday, IG Field is getting a brand new playing surface. So, Gareth, this is, can go one of two ways. It can be unifying, it can be bonding, or it could be a disaster for a brand new club built by Phil Dos Santos. Which way do you lean here? Well, first off, I'd like to point out you have the best background in One Soccer Today history. How could you write that? that one one, one lonely today. plant, and I had to like <laughs> squint my eyes to actually read what that said. Uh, well done, Adam Jenkins. Thank um, you. For Valor, uh, this is a good news story, a feel-good story. We shouldn't uh, get away from that fact, the fact that they are getting new field turf. Um, and it, a drastic improvement in terms of the surface that not only Valor, but all teams will be playing on across the Canadian Premier League. Jordan Wilson will get into more on that because he's had the uh, the, the the privilege, I guess, of playing on that surface. The Pleasure. Pleasure. Multiple tries. Pleasure. <laughs> RIP <laughs> IAD, IG field surface. Um, but this, this, this means a difficult start just based upon an early June start. The first seven, eight games of the season we've played away from home. This has happened across leagues. Um, you know, in, in Major League Soccer, Toronto FC, back-to-back -back years with renovations to BMO Field, had their first seven and eight games respectively in 2015 and 16, played away from home. In 2016, by the way, they went on to play in an MLS Cup final that year. So it, it doesn't mean doom or gloom, but this is going to be a significant challenge to Valor, a team where the pressure is on their manager and Phil DeSantos, the, the, the pressure is on the club to go out and perform. They made sweeping changes to their squad. 15 players are out, are not returning. They've already signed six or seven or eight already. And it's going to be very difficult on the fly with all the travel to go on and come together and be able to come up with results. The worst case scenario for Valor is that they get buried here early. They come out of the gate. There's this uh, amalgamation period where it's going to take some time for them to embrace a new manager, embrace new teammates, and, and they and they really struggle out of the gate. This is a team that's never made the playoffs in Canadian playoff history. And if you're looking up all season uh, and the pressure's on later on in the year to pick up three points, three points, three, it's going to be really tough for Valor and a steep hill to climb. Remember, this hasn't been a great team away from home. Uh, three wins in 2023 away from home, three wins away in 2012 away from home, 13 points in 14 last year, 12 points in 14 the year before. So there isn't even a track record of away success here. So uh, you hope that they can take advantage of maybe some other teams uh, looking to gel a little bit earlier on, but it's a really difficult one for Valor. The way I'm looking at it, guys, uh, short-term pain for long-term gain. Uh, and hopefully the short-term pain isn't that painful. Jordan Wilson, short-term pain for no more pain, perhaps. If you'd like a, an ode to the old turf, a soliloquy of how much you'll miss playing in Winnipeg on that surface, feel free. But your thoughts on the news and, and how the players are going to have to adapt and come together on what is about a six-week road trip to start the season. Well, there's an ode that I can't ignore, which is in the in the bubble. I have a huge gash on my knee just from falling, <laughs> blocking a shot from Mo Farsi that was about to score and go top corner. Um, but yeah, that, it wasn't a great and ideal pitch to play on IG Field. I'm glad God answers prayers. It had to get torn up. It had to get laid down. Every player who has played there knows it needs to be changed. And look, now we have eight pitches in the league that are all in, in good condition. All teams can go and play good football. IG Field was the one I was missing. This team was three, four, and seven, um, as as Wheels alluded to, away from home, but also three, four, and seven at home. So I think what needs to happen this season is a decent start. 
right? Take care of business and you, you choose one. Their goal for 2023 is to make sure that their home record was good and it was poor. But now with that new surface coming into it in June, having more games and from the midseason to the end being at home, they have to use that to their advantage. Also, for me playing in this league and when you're traveling on the road, I feel like it's all up to the manager and the leaders on the team to get things right within the hotel, within training, all of that. You can really use that moment to be a band of brothers. We saw it with certain teams last season as well. There's a run with even York United when they were losing a lot of games, but they used the road trip, ended up playing Halifax 3-0. You can use that time sometimes being away as like, hey, find that roommate that you would never really be close with if you're playing at home, but maybe you're close with, you're going out to battle. Phil DeSantis has to use all of those measures to his advantage, going bowling, road trips, camping, whatever it is to get that unit together. <laughs> because if they can get that started in the beginning, watch when they go and play at home. They could be thriving on a new pitch, right, where everyone's feeling good. So really have to take advantage of that. And I hope that they do because this Valor side are going to have new interesting pieces. But you kind of want to see them playing playoff football. They always kind of get close. I mean, last year was an abysmal season, but usually they're always around around the bubble. Hopefully they can cross over that line and they wouldn't be a team that you'd want to play down the stretch because they have nothing to lose. And Ollie, a bit of a karmic balancing of the scales, isn't it, with the kickoff we had two seasons ago where they got to start the season for like a month or so at home. And now everything kind of comes out in the wash. Your the thoughts bubble. on the news here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's that's kind of the prime example of why I think there's an opportunity here for Valor is, is that your Ooh. starts just don't define you in this league. Like in that bubble, they won six of their first seven. Guess what happened then? You know, Rob Gale gets fired. They missed the They're playoffs. Fire. That, that season goes down the toilet. So I think there's countless examples of this league. Halifax going winless through their first eight games last season. Cavalry won one of seven. The Drunders. Cavalry won one of seven and won the league by a mile. Forge have been notorious for their slow starts over, over the years and are the most successful team in, in the Canadian Premier League. So, like, if you, if you get yourself in an 0-7 hole or however many games they're playing, obviously that's going to be a big problem for them. But if you can pick up a couple of wins and, and just kind of tide yourself over through this period, I think the opportunity to play something like 14 of your last 21 games at home mm. um, is is potentially a huge opportunity for Valor. So they've got to handle this with, as Wheels pointed out, a very new squad, a lot of different players. But I think if they can get through it, then it, it could actually pan out not too badly for them. We're going to head to the West Coast next for some topics and some chat on Pacific and Vancouver. We had already discussed on Monday's edition of One Soccer Today the departure of Manny Aparicio. You can now add Amir Didich and Easton on Gano. Gareth Wheeler, thoughts on the Not punch? bad. Not, Not bad. bad. I'll work on <laughs> Three big departures on Vancouver Island. It's going to be a very different team. If anything, maybe it helps James Merriman whittle down, narrow down to a preferred 11, but there's going to be some big replacements, no doubt, especially at center back, though Thomas Mayer Jaguar's option was picked up and he'll be around with Paul Amadume and the fullbacks Kunle Dadaluk and George Mukum Bilwa. Let's get some thoughts on that, Oliver Platt, on what's transpiring right now for the men in purple. Firstly, Easton off Garo. Right now, oh, yeah. guys, 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 is is Easton <laughs> he gone? Garo, <laughs> he's, gone Garo. he's gone. Garo, he's gone. Garo, that would have been a nine. Garo, um, okay, that's the winner. We move on. <laughs> look, as, as far as on Garo's <laughs> concerns, I think this is one that probably suits player and club. It just didn't work out. He, he, he's you know, he's a good player, he's had a good track record in the Canadian Premier League with FC Edmonton. For whatever reason, and, and he wasn't the only one at Pacific, to be honest, last season, it, it, it just didn't seem to fit. It didn't seem to click. He gets the opportunity now to go to Italy, which I think has, has been something he's he's been hoping to do. That was the country he wanted to play in. Um, and Pacific gets a fresh start in terms of clearing some some cap space and the opportunity to bring in some new faces at that centre forward position, which was a problem for them all season long. So um, it's a it's, it's a big off season for them. Obviously, with Didich gone, Aparicio gone, the spine of the team is going to need replacing. They've done it before, so I think Pacific is is capable of doing that. Um, but certainly, that's a team. When you look at the the playoff teams of last year, probably the one we're asking the most questions about and has the most doubt about their roster right now. 
And I think we've we definitely at times when it was required last season, shone the spotlight on Emil Gazdoff in his struggles, especially the be- beginning part of this season. He had a fantastic finish, showed those flashes of promise that Pacific has been touting, why they have so much faith in this young man. But to lose a stalwart like Amir Didic is certainly going to be a big blow, Gareth, because their roster right now, there's 13 players or 11 players, excuse me, currently signed. Gazdoff, Amadume, Dadaluk, Mayor Jaguer, Mukumbilwa, Vliet, Lamoth, Toussaint, Yates, heard and read i think james merriman and paul Byrne have some shopping to do yeah there's some good players though in, in that team and as ollie said they've been able to replace players before bustos i mean go, go down the list and they've been able to play a high quality i think the club has a, a solid identity of bringing through good young players and giving them opportunity i think some of their recruitment head of the draft was very good and i do think they'll have a carter two to play that remain up their sleeve right now but did with all due respect to Aparicio, I, I obviously love the player. Didich is a massive loss for this team. For me, top three, maybe even the best defender to play in the Canadian Premier League. Solid from an attacking perspective, set piece perspective. Is there a center back that's better in this league? And he came up with so many big moments for this club when, when needed the most. He's 29 years of age now, and it was tipped off a couple of weeks ago that perhaps he's looking to you know, go and find a situation that can maybe financially better him longer term and, 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 and try maybe a new challenge and who can blame him at this point. This is a really good chance for him to, to maybe earn a bigger paycheck somewhere. I'm not sure if that's USL. I'm not sure if there's MLS interest, but certainly he's weighing up his options outside of the Canadian Premier League at this point. And that's what the league's about. Older player moving on. He knows he can come back at some point and play to finish his career, but opening the door for a younger player to step in. So now it's about recruitment, making sure that they understand who's a good fit alongside TMG at the back while giving some other young players a chance. As for Ongaro, like, good player but he stunk last year like there's no way around it like there was an opportunity for him to really lead that line but so many big misses the manager clearly didn't have faith in him i think it's good for the player because there's clearly something there you know i rate the player just the season he had was below standard for him and and perhaps going abroad a a new opportunity a new look will be able to bring out the best in him so i i I wish him the best of luck but the, the change guys for pacific I think it should be welcomed because the way that last season ended, bar that mini playoff run, there was a little bit of a disaster at the end of the season. So some some new faces, some new voices. I think that that could actually be uh, a really good thing for Pacific moving forward. Jordan, do you agree? I do agree. I agree with a lot of wheels, what we all said, but I will say this with uh, Amir Didich. Um, I will back as well that I think he's one of the top uh, defenders that have ever played in the Canadian Premier League. He has so many things that you just can't teach. One, his size being 6'5". I'm not really afraid of players. I'm corners, whatever. I have a little bit of leap. I know I'm 5'10". Amir did this with someone like, oh, yeah. you got him? I got I got him? <laughs> okay, okay, I have him. He was the, ask any center back. It sometimes took two of us. I would grab him at the hips. Sometimes you'd still get a header on. He's that big. He's that strong. But also, he's a player that saw plays and, and played the ball forward. Usually you get one or the other when you're that big. If you're six five, you're good in the air. You're dominant. No one gets by you. But also a player that was setting up plays and leading from the back. And the wheels, the matches that we saw that Amir Didis wasn't playing or was injured or was off of the sideline. It's chaotic for Pacific. He was a leader, right? Led by example. Who's doing that? I'm not saying that the specific side side is doomed. But two years ago, you have Jamar Dixon that was your captain, and Josh Hurd has done a phenomenal job being Josh Hurd. But next in line was Amir Didis. And Manny Aparicio, those two are gone now. So this is a this is a call for who's going to step up, who's going to be the new guys. It's hard to ask the new players coming in, whoever they bring, to be the guys to step up. It's going to probably be someone that's in the squad that already knows the players. So they have to help uh, step up and help Josh Hurd. Um, but when you look at Pacific side, I think the biggest thing is just about their game changers. We didn't know about it last year. Guys who are going to put the ball in the back of their net, guys who are consistent in front of goal. And they need to find that that's that touch early. You can't be going into playoffs the way they did this year and not knowing who are your big dogs, not knowing who are your front three. So hopefully Merriman can get that figured out um, sooner rather than later. Read, read and heard. I, I think you got your wide players taken care of. Done. Yeah. Need that number nine, need that focal point. As all he said, the spine going to need someone else in the central midfielder that the central midfield that can help pull the strings. Now you're going to need a center back. Once you solidify that, then Pacific will be back in a really good place. 
Well, we know the Pacific will be starting their season on April the 13th, as mentioned earlier, in the Coastal Clash. But for now, let's cross the Salish Sea and talk about Vancouver, who are continuing to make CPL history with another youngest signing in league history. That is My Grady team. McDonald of Surrey, British Columbia, on a standard player contract through 2026. He, of course, takes that record from TJ Tahid. He is a player who has played for the Republic of Ireland and Canadian Youth International programs jordan let's start there for the player you're a pro you're getting ready to come into camp and you have a 15 year old a 16 year old a 17 18 seemingly all the teenagers and they stuck around they seem to really take those strides how do you think ashwin Gopi and some of the veterans on that team are going to be able to welcome him into the professional environment and help him grow i mean people always say right quality has no age like you, if you go into europe this, this is happening a lot right where 15 16 year olds are, are getting into camp um, it's just unheard of in Canada. One, our, our league's new, but two, there's just like we actually divide youth football and, and men's football. But at the end of the day, if you can hold your own, you can take the lumps, you can also dish it out. The earlier, the better. Um, so with this Vancouver side, what I like about them is you're starting to see their identity grow. And to be honest, Wheels was the first one to call it uh, about this side. And I won't say that for the West Coast, it has switched, but it's definitely begun to see a side that is like playing positive football. And obviously you have a move like a, a Norman Jr. coming back or Ben Fisk. Like these are stable guys. They need a lead from the, the second they step onto the pitch and then have some continuity within the squad. But I like this team. I like that they're they're growing young. I like that they, they're trusting young players to produce. But again, I think in the CPL specifically, it's all about that balance. You, your oldest players have to be playing like they're hungry and they want a new deal. And your youngest players have to be looking up to them but not afraid, saying, hey, I want that spot as well. If you can get that, that middle ground working, usually those are the teams that end up playing towards the end of the season. That, so, and that's the thing. I like there, this back over side. There's so many teams, Jordan, uh, and we see them all the time that try to go young, but they just play all young players. But the fact yeah. that you have the balance. Gar Garcia, you you know, you you bring in a Ben Fisk as JJJJDTV uh, uh, reports <laughs> that uh, that David Norman Jr. is coming in. You're going to have some really experienced players, something they didn't have at the beginning of last season. So there's balance. They kept their best players. They haven't really lost anyone of massive significant significance yes hundle is a good player but I, I mean he was out of the picture for ashton Guppy as well so when you're looking at this side right now i think they're the best team in british columbia i think that they have a better squad Ooh. than pacific they ended the season that way they're coming together a full season of a former pacific player where diaz Look out. Welcome to the dark side. Vancouver FC making some moves. Would like to see another center back come in. But man, this team, I think they're going to be turning some heads in 2024. That's right. As Gareth and Jordan allude to, if and when that David Norman Jr. move is made, he would be the eighth BC-born player on this Love club it. and a lot of players from the greater Metro Vancouver area. Oliver Platt, what have you made of Ashvin Gopi's offseason as of January 18th? I don't think I'm quite ready to go to uh, the, the whole power shift thing in, in BC just yet. I, I think Vancouver is obviously going to be, I, I would expect them to be better than they were last season. And frankly, I think second half of last season, they were probably better than Pacific. Certainly they collected more points from, from July 1st onwards. But that's kind of why I lean back towards being okay with changes at Pacific. Like I think they needed changes to come. As talented as that team looked last at times last season, it was, I, I think ultimately it was a little bit smoke and mirrors. You know, Pacific, if, if you could, if you let them play on the counter attack, they could absolutely destroy you, right? They, they had that in, in, in their arsenal all season long. But at home, like, I don't think they, they scored much more than a goal a game. Like, ultimately, all that talent they had didn't really pay off. Um, I think they need to, to undergo some fairly major changes to that roster. Those changes are coming. They may not be losing everyone exactly that they wanted to lose. I'm sure you'd rather have Aparicio and Didic in the team. But one way or the other, it's going to enforce changes. And, and I think you still... I like the players that they've got on their roster right now, even though it looks thin. And you wait and see what they're going to bring in and, and how they're going to, going to rebuild that group. So... Vancouver, I would expect to be improved. I'm not sure I'm quite ready to go there yet as, as saying they've leaked from Pacific. So right now, Oliver Platt, you're still saying Pacific finishes higher than Vancouver at the end of the season? Yes. Gareth? Mm. Oh, I, I, I made it very clear. <laughs> I think I brought it up. Vancouver <laughs> FC, right now on paper and in practice, I think a better, uh, better side, better squad, a better potential to do some damage this season than Pacific.
Jordan Wilson break the tie. Oh, I'm not ready to relinquish it. I still think we're sitting all. I still think I think it'll be close. I think there'll be when the coastal clash is happening. I think there'll be positive matches and very exciting. But I just can't count Pacific out. They're, they've been at the around in and around the top. It's, Losing it's their to best two players too. They're, I get it, but they have their brand of football. They have Pacific their Pacific have been sneaky elite pretty much since the beginning of this league, where you're like, okay, and they kind of middle, and then they go on and win the twenty. They're the only other club other than Forge with uh, North Star Cup retroactively. I can't even keep them straight anymore. But That's you know okay. what I'm saying? You did well though. Thank you, Jordan. Before and because of that compliment, <laughs> bribery always accepted. I'm coming back to you as we move on to talk about York United and the addition, the reported addition of Frank Stirring, the Canadian international. Obviously, a hole at the back there. Roger Thompson, the captain, he retires. Tas Murtakoudis goes to Valor. It's a pretty good piece to build around with uh, NEC, similar to Dan Klomp, profile age. There are some Dan Klomp similarities here. What do you make of this move? Yeah, I think he's going to have to have a Dan Klomp uh, performance uh, this season. I don't want to put pressure on the young man I've never met. But just looking at this York <laughs> United side, Paris G was also a huge center back who was a makeshift center back, but mm. played there a lot this season. was probably one of the best players. They don't have anyone. Noah Batney being a young player who I thought had a lot of quality was just a bit green to the league and to that, that position. But it's going to be a player that has to come in and basically be Iron Man, in my opinion. He's going to have to play 98% of the matches. He's going to have to lead, basically be a captain in the back. And can you go and do that from the beginning? It's a lot because you can have talent as a player, but you have to get acclimated to where you're training, how your coach likes to train, how Martin Nash's style, the players that you're with. You have to like them. You also have to get settled in a new city. Hopefully you can do all of that. Um, reports have said he's talented. I want to go and see it personally. I'll, I'll definitely be at training to go check him out. But I think he needs to have a big year for them to be successful. And you can see with York United, they needed center backs. They need probably one or two more. But he, Stirring, is going to be probably the leader and the, and the big dog at the back. And I hope he could just lead them because that is so crucial to the way that they play, having a ball-playing center back. So we hope for the best. Jordan probably attending training while we're recording an episode of One Soccer Today. So if he's ever <laughs> randomly not here, he's just scouting Frank Stirring. Ollie, your thoughts on the reported deal? Yeah, I think he's, from what I've seen of him with, with Canada very briefly, looked like a good player, certainly someone who could come into the CPL and, and make an impact, played at a similar level, uh, like you guys mentioned, so, to some pretty successful players who have come into this league before. Um, I think Noah Batne is, is very talented as well. Down the stretch last season, he, he really impressed me. I spoke with Martin Nash recently, and he said he thought at times that Batne was their best centre-back, even being the by far the least experienced among that group. Um, I also believe that there will be a third player coming into that centre-back group to, to join them as well. So I don't think it's just going to be stirring and, and a Batnay taking the entire loads. I think they'll, they've will they got one more up their sleeve to add there to, to give themselves what they hope will be a much more reliable group of centre-backs than they had last season, where they were just decimated by injuries. You know, Johnny Grant started there in, in the middle of defence the, at the start of the season. Paris G was covering it for for a lot of the year. Then a Batney came in, obviously midway. So they just had nowhere near enough stability at that position last season. Conceded too many goals. I think they're hoping with stirring a Batney plus one, uh, that should be a much more solid group this season. Who's the name, Oliver Platt? Who's it going to be? Know. I can't tell. <laughs> okay. I couldn't tell you. I don't know. Well, uh, Frank Lee, I like the signing. There we go. And we'll see if it can cause a stir in the Canadian Premier League. All of a sudden, it's like a position that if you have good center backs, then you got to feel pretty good about yourself. With Didich going, Medjugorje James going, Diego Speo going, all of a sudden, some of the top center backs of the Canadian Premier League are out. So I think it's a position where there was great depth. There's some more question marks heading into this new season. I know from 2021 when he joined up with the Canadian men's national team ahead of World Cup qualifying, John Herdman rated the player. He's a good ball-moving defender, didn't play a whole lot, has been playing at lower levels, uh, hasn't been with the side since last summer. So it might take some time for him to kind of build up into that match fitness. But from everything I heard and saw and people I talked to, um, absolutely rate the player and still at a good age at about 25. So I think those Dan Klomp comparables, Adam, I, I didn't really think about it much before that, but I think you're onto something here. That could be a really good comparable here. My pun game may not be as elite as yours, Gareth, but from time to time, I come in and surprise you. Few and are, he's, Adam, few that's are. you know what that is remarkably <laughs> true and because there is a way to recover from that backhanded compliment let's move on to our visa women's football i can
It is presented by Visa, our women's football report, and some big news for a Canadian international footballer in NWSL land, and that is Nichelle Prince has been traded from the Houston Dash, and she will be joining Desiree Scott at the Kansas City Current. She will also be under the tutelage of former U.S. women's national team head coach Vlatko Andonovsky at KC. Drafted back in 2017, 28th overall Prince. She was moved in exchange for CC Kaiser and an international slot in 2024. Great to see the pride of Ajax Ontario get a big move and try and get some minutes here, Oliver Platt, because she finished the season back in that form that we started to see from her on multiple occasions with the national team scoring goals in being a threat up top really making a claim for the number nine spot yeah i think she is the the first choice number nine for, for canada as of today um uh, and theoretically going into the olympic games so i think the interesting thing about about this move will be seeing where she plays for kansas city uh, do they use her more out wide do they use her as a center forward if she plays for her country um i think looking at that team on paper there does seem to be room potentially for, for competition at the number nine spot and, and someone to come in and take that job. Um, you know, it wouldn't be a bad place to, to be with Dabinia su supplying you from a yeah. deeper position. So let, let, let's wait and see. But hopefully this looks like a promising move in terms of Nichelle Prince getting regular minutes at, at one of those attacking positions. And she's going to be a key player going into, into Paris. And Jordan yeah, Wilson, back to that form. For him. Yeah, sorry. Just to, just to get back to that form as well in 2022, like five goals, two assists. Just want to see her being regular because I think that club form and then going into national team, which I truly care about when she comes and plays for Canada, just want to be seasoned. You want to be feeling confident. You can bang in some goals. So we hope that this move kind of gives her that playing style. But yeah, we'll wait and see if it's on the wing or if it's up top. But regardless, I just want to, I just really care about the productivity and we hope to see her just playing her best football. Well, 2024 is going to be a huge year for Nichelle Prince, currently on yeah. 96 caps for country. Yeah. Yeah. She is going to likely become an, a centurion for this program at or just before the Paris Olympic Games. And we'll have a new club to settle into as well to see if she can add to her 16 goals for Canada at the Olympic Games. Congratulations to Nichelle. We look forward to seeing her with the current. And we thank Visa for today's women's soccer report. Let's move on and finish the show with our Tony Betts top picks. These are, of course, our buy show on the hour soccer lines. We do not fail to get them in for you. And just so the boys know, I'm going to be starting to tally up the results for the Friday episode. And that's one of the reasons why. Just, I'm just not bankroll. Just bankroll. Just adding that cash oh, yes. right into. Make sure you get my Bristol City market. pick. <laughs> Well, that was a that was good, a good one, one for him. I'm pretty no, confident no, in my uh, Newport County as well. But we're going to go back to team. AFCON today, Thanks, gentlemen. Obviously. That is where we are going to begin our Tony Bet topics. Senegal, Oliver Platt, minus 103. Cameroon, the underdogs at plus 320. Yeah, I don't fancy Cameroon. They didn't start well. And just looking at the squads on paper, I think Senegal's the stronger team. So I will take them at even money uh, to win this one. You're at the draw at plus 220. Are you tempted? No, no. <laughs> Senegal, the, the holders of this competition are the way to go. A far stronger side, as Ollie said on paper. Came out of the gate, convincing performance. Cameroon was anything but. Uh, they played to a 1-1 draw with Guinea, who had a man sent off in that game. What's going on with Andre Onana, like staying with Manchester United and taking that private plane down and just not being there in time. And now he's answering questions about commitment to country, even though he was on the outside looking in before, like, this is just putting the fun in dysfunction right now. Like Cameroon just need to get this straight. I'm going to go with the harmonious side that are the title holders in this competition. Senegal minus 103. Full unit Jordan play, Wilson. Adam. Full unit play. I'll, I'll make the I'll make this quick. Wheels, that was never going to end well with Onana when you try to ooh, play a game but then fly in and get to a oh, game and play. Ambitious. Never, never, ambitious. never going to end well. I'll go a bit further with Senegal. I think they're going to win it all. I think they're going to do a back, back AFCON. This is one of the strongest back -back. sides in AFCON. And I just think, I think they were a bit unlucky in the World Cup, but this is just a strong Senegalese side. I think they can do damage. I think they're winning it all. The AFC Asian Cup. We got to go quick on this one, gentlemen. Iraq versus Japan, plus 1,000 for the Iraqis, minus 455, <laughs> Jordan Wilson, for the team that has been a wagon, Japan. The plus 1,000 is tempting, but. <laughs> I don't think I mean, so. It's Japan, but at that price, don't bother. So, 
<laughs> no, but it's it's more about whether you, uh, Iraq can keep it close. I don't think they can. I think that take Japan on the handicap. I think it's at uh, 1.75. So they need to win by two to win half of your bet. Um, that's a play I'll make, though. I think that Japan can struggle to start this tournament. I think it means good things later on. Play for us today on One Soccer Today. We'll see you tomorrow, everyone. Thank you.